Well, the struggle to overhaul the criminal justice system in the United States has reached a pivotal moment, from the Obama administration's push to reform harsh and racially biased sentencing for drug offenses to the recent decision by the New York by New York State to reform its use of solitary confinement. There is a growing momentum toward rethinking the system. But new battles have also emerged, like the fight over stand-your-ground laws in states like Florida, where a number of recent court cases have highlighted the issue of racial bias in the court system. Marissa Alexander, an African-American woman of color who fired what she says was a warning shot into a wall near her abusive husband, is facing up to 60 years in prison at her retrial. Michael Dunn, who shot and killed an African-American teenager in a dispute over loud music in the same state of Florida, is facing a minimum of 60 years for attempted murder. But the jury failed to convict him of the central charge in the case, the murder of Jordan Davis, a case that, for many, recalled the shooting of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman. To talk more about these issues, we spend the rest of the hour with the world-renowned author, activist, scholar Angela Davis, professor emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz, for over four decades. She's been one of the most influential activists and intellectuals in the United States. She's speaking here in New York on Friday at the Beyond the Bars conference up at Columbia University. It's great to have you here, Angela. Thank you, Amy. Thank Do you, you sense you, progress? Well, yes. I think that uh, this is a pivotal moment. Uh, there are openings, uh, and I think it's very important to point out that people have been struggling over these issues uh, for years and, and for decades. Uh, uh, this is also a problematic uh, moment, uh, and those of us who identify as prison abolitionists, as opposed to prison reformers, uh, make the point uh, that oftentimes reforms uh, uh, create situations where um, mass incarceration becomes even more entrenched. Uh, and so, therefore, we have to uh, think about what, in the long run, will um, produce <laughs> decarceration. Uh, fewer people behind bars, uh, and hopefully, eventually, in, in the future, uh, the possibility of imagining a landscape without prisons, where other means are used to address issues of harm, where social problems, uh, such as illiteracy and poverty, do not lead uh, uh, vast numbers of people uh, along a trajectory that leads to prison. I'm wondering, in terms uh, of the first term of President Obama was often referred to by some uh, uh, as the, through the myth of um, post-racial America represented by the election of President Obama. But even he has shied away, until recently, <laughs> dealing with some of the racial inequities of our system, especially the prison system. I'm wondering if you could see a, a, a movement or transformation in the president himself and how he deals with some of these well, issues. Well, this is the second term. Uh, he has really has nothing to lose. Uh, and it really is about time that he began to address what is one of the most critical issues in this country. Um, uh, it's uh, pretty unfortunate that, uh, that Obama has waited until now to speak out. Uh, but it's good that he is speaking out. And I think we can uh, use this opportunity to perhaps uh, uh, achieve some important victories. Explain what you mean, Angela, the difference between uh, being a prison abolitionist, how you uh, describe yourself, and a prison reformer. Well, of course, um, in 1977, uh, when the Attica Rebellion uh, took place, that was a, a really important moment in the history of mass incarceration, the history of the, the, the prison in this country. Um, the, the prisoners, uh, who were the spokespeople for the uprising, um, uh, indicated that they were struggling for a world without prisons. Uh, uh, during the 1970s, the, the notion of um, prison abolition became very important. And as a matter of fact, um, public intellectuals, uh, judges, uh, journalists uh, took it very seriously and began to think about alternatives. Uh, However, uh, uh, in the 1980s, with the dismantling of, the, of, of, of social services, structural adjustment in the global south, the rise of global capitalism, uh, we began to see the uh, 
prison emerging as a major institution to address the problems that were produced by uh, the deindustrialization, lack of jobs, uh, less funding into education, uh, lack of education, the close down of, of, of systems that were designed uh, to assist people who had mental and emotional problems. Uh, the, uh, the, and now, of course, the prison system is uh, a um, is also a psychiatric uh, facility. The, I always point out that the largest psychiatric facilities uh, uh, in the country are Rikers Island in New York and Cook County uh, in in Chicago. So the the question is, how does one address the needs of prisoners? Uh, uh, by instituting reforms that are not going to um, create a stronger uh, uh, prison system. Uh, uh, now there are something like two and a half million people behind bars, if one counts all of the various uh, aspects of what we call the prison industrial complex, including military prisons, jails in Indian country, uh, state and federal prisons, county jails, uh, immigrant detention faci uh, facilities, which are which constitute the fastest growing sector of the prison industrial complex. Uh, yeah, so how the, the question is, how do we respond to the needs of those who are inside and at the same time begin a process of decarceration that will uh, uh, allow us to uh, end this reliance on imprisonment as a, as a default method of addressing, uh, 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 not addressing, really, uh, major social problems? And, and how do you see the changing public attitudes toward the uh, war on drugs uh, and the, uh, the the willingness of some states now to begin a decriminalization process and recognize drug addiction more as a as a health problem than as a criminal justice problem uh, do you, you you see that having some hope of sharply reducing the prison population yes I think I think it is important but again um, it's also essential to point out that people have been struggling around these issues. Uh, for a very long time. And uh, oftentimes, uh, when these um, new moments emerge, it is as if uh, the legislators uh, uh, have have come up with this idea for the very first time. Uh, uh, and, of course, it is important that decriminalization is happening in, in, in certain states, because drugs have served the, the so-called war on drugs, which, as we know, has been a war on poor communities, black and Latino communities all over the country. That uh, so-called war on drugs has been the major uh, motor driving the rising uh, prison population. So uh, I often point out we need to look at the corresponding pharmaceutical industrial complex uh, when we, you know, think about the way drugs have served as a pretext for incarcerating such vast numbers of people of color. What about the for-profit system, the for-profit prison system? Well, um, they're private prisons, of course. Uh, uh, um, the U.S. has given rise to this uh, private prison industry. Uh, Corrections Corporation of America was the first private prison corporation. Uh, and now, of course, we have uh, institutions like G4S, which is the third largest uh, um, private corporation in the entire world, uh, third only to, number one, Walmart, number two, Foxconn. And this security corporation, uh, which has which owns and operates prisons all over the country, which uh, is involved in, in the uh, production of the carceral technologies used in occupied Palestine by Israel, which, involve, which is involved in, in deporting uh, prisoners from Europe to the global south, from the U.S. to, to Mexico. Uh, uh, one begins to see how it all comes together. But I think that private prisons uh, are not the only indication of the uh, a thoroughgoing corporatization of punishment. Uh, even public prisons rely on private corporations, and health care has been outsourced, food production has been outsourced. Uh, 
the, the few programs that there are in prisons have been outsourced. So there is a, a privatization uh, of uh, in, uh, imprisonment such that uh, that it's it's not possible to consider the issue of mass incarceration without looking at uh, uh, the important role it plays in the economy. And this means, of course, that people who have very little to do with uh, criminal justice, with punishment, have no stakes in that, really, uh, have stakes in the uh, continued uh, um, increase in prison populations, because it means more profit for them. Mm -hmm.